So in this lecture, we are going to um, try to compute the efficient unemployment rate. Uh, we'll derive formulas for that, and then we'll apply them to the US to see a bit um, what the efficient unemployment rate on the, U, um, on the US labor market. To do that, we'll use uh, an approach that's called the sufficient statistic approach. And so before we start, I want to discuss a little bit what is this approach? Uh, and in particular, I want to do that because it really differs um, quite significantly from standard macro approach to um, op optimal policy. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, for um, macro people, um, sufficient statistics, you know, 10, um, 15 years ago, they were completely unheard of, uh, something that people uh, you know, didn't use and didn't really, were not really familiar with. Um, things are, are changing. Um, sufficient statistics are starting to permeate into macro, but nevertheless, I want to um, explain a little bit what they are, what it means to do a sufficient statistic analysis, and also how it differs from um, standard kind of a macro approach to policy. Um, so typically in macro, um, policy analysis is um, very structural. So what does that mean that it's structural? It means that you uh, make an assumption about the entire structure of the economy and then given this fully fledged structure, you're going to proceed and analyze policy. So you're going to assume the entire structure of the economy and um, study policy um, within this um, structure. <clears throat> now, what's the limitation of this approach? Well, the main limitation is that the assumptions that you make about the structure of the economy, um, very often they already give you an answer about um, what the optimal policy should be or um, you know, what the efficient um, unemployment rate um, is. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's a big issue is that you're going to make assumptions and this assumption will determine, you know, assumptions always determine results, of course, but um, <clears throat> ideally you want you know, as much as, much as possible, um, you, you know, you want to make decisions that are based by um, empirical evidence, uh, that are based on empirical evidence, whereas often the assumption you make about the structure of the economy, and in particular the structure of markets, are not based on evidence, you know, they are just kind of, you know, postulate, um, you know, it's almost axiomatic, like, oh, markets are competitive, uh, perfectly competitive. Markets are monopolistically um, competitive. The thing that based on this assumption, or, you know, in matching model, Rosio's condition holds. Almost like an axiomatic decision. Um, and then, but then the problem is that from that, everything else follows. All the policy recommendations are going to follow. And for these initial statements, um, they are not, you know, they are almost used axiomatically. They are not based on any evidence. And so it's very problematic. Basically, the answers you give for policy are already uh, baked into um, the axioms that you used. Um, so uh, that's a, that's a uh, big problem. Um, <clears throat> so uh, structure. And it... it Essentially, it's really the, the, the market the, the, the assumption you make about, about markets that's going to be key about how markets operate. That's really the crucial assumption that will determine the efficiency properties. Market structure is assumed um, I guess we can say it's almost religiously You're looking at evidence, but it determines 
or um, policy results. So that's the problem of taking a structural, you know, like a purely structural approach. Uh, is that your, your um, basically your um, policy insights and baked into um, the initial assumptions about market structure. So let me give you just a couple of examples. So say, <clears throat> if you assume, uh, you know, if you assume Valrasian markets, then you know that markets are efficient um, policy is unnecessary. But it's not that you've looked at the real world and you measured things and then you're like, oh, well, yeah, we are definitely, we don't need policy. No, it's just you've assumed, you know, you've assumed that you've made this assumption of the Valrasian market, uh, you know, because you follow the uh, prophet Valras and then, and then uh, that's what comes out. That's what comes out of that. Or that, say, if you assume. <clears throat> monopolistic market then necessarily you know you know that you have markups that are positive and then you know that your economy is always economy is um, <clears throat> is in a sense too stack there is always not not enough activity just because there are markups everywhere. And again, it's not that you've looked at the world, you're like, oh, yeah, activity is insufficient. It's just you've made an assumption that markets are monopolistic because, you know, you wanted the price sectors and then that's what happened. Same thing if you do like a mono, if you assume like a monopsonistic market, the same thing, uh, you know, the same thing is go the same thing is going to be true. Uh, you have, in a sense, markdowns that are positive, and then, uh, uh, and you know, in the first case, you want to uh, you want to reduce markups and you want to reduce prices. In the second case, you want to reduce markdowns, you want to increase prices. But you know, like you've already taken a stand about where your uh, econ economy, uh, where your economy. So that's that's the first issue with this um, structural approach that um, policy insights are baked into initial assumption about market structure. So either your prices are red right, you don't need policy, prices are always too high, with monopolistic market, prices are always too low, with monopolistic market, you know. Um, so you can't actually learn anything from the real world uh, here. So that's the first uh, that's the first that's the first issue with this structural approach. Um, so a second issue is that um, once you take uh, once you take a structural approach, you know you have your model and it's detailed, you know you have a bunch of assumptions and you have a bunch of parameters and once you do, want to do a bit of um, policy analysis, you've got to calibrate all these parameters um, so that you can run uh, simulations. But here the main issue is that uh, very often you're, you know you're, you actually don't observe that parameter in the real world, and so you're not able to um, properly um, estimate uh, the parameter, um, even less do yes do like a proper identification of the parameter and a proper estimation of the parameter. And that's especially true if you have a large model with many, many of these parameters. So many parameters are unobservable. Uh, and they cannot be um, properly 
identified and measured. Then you, you know, um, they can be properly estimated. So that's a big issue also of a fully, uh, you know, this fully structured approach. Um, so we've, we have issue with estimating parameters and of course the fact that the structure, you know, with a lot of structure, a lot of the policy insights are already um, predetermined. So here we're going to move away from that structural approach um, and instead we're going to take a sufficient statistic approach. To address these um, issues, and take uh, and take a subscription statistic approach. Now, um, where does this uh, subscription statistic approach come from? Well, um, the social statistic approach that come from um, public finance, and we'll see, you know, uh, we'll see exactly what it is. But it has a long history. Um, we we'll see like the idea of social statistics, you know, was already kind of around in the 50s, 60s, 70s in public finance, but it wasn't really formalized. Um, It wasn't really formalized, it was just something that people were doing, um, but without much formalism. Um, in its modern form, uh, I think the first sufficient statistic analysis um, is this paper by Emmanuel Saez, published in Restud in um, 2001 on optimal taxation. And that showed how you can study optimal sta taxation with sufficient statistics. Uh, so that was a very influential paper um, after Emmanuel's paper, there were a bunch of other applications um, of sufficient statistics. So uh, Ratchetti in um, 2006, he had a very nice paper on unemployment insurance with sufficient statistics. Uh, and then, you know, after that, it really started to um, spread in public finance and people have used it for you know, I mean, now people are using social statistics for everything, really, in public finance. But um, these were kind of the early uh, paper of this uh, modern uh, social statistic approach. Um, and then uh, Raj had also a very nice survey in 2009 um, that was explaining the origin of sufficient statistics, discussing so the you know, kind of old school, um, the old papers that were already without, you know, maybe having this name, but that we're using this methodology, reviewing, of course, the modern contribution to sufficient statistics from Emmanuel's paper up forward. Um, that's a very nice survey. And um, uh, right, and then, you know, and, and then now there's been, of course, a huge development in uh, public finance, and it's, uh, it's, very, it's, uh, it's very common. Now, in micro, uh, in 2009, when uh, Raj's survey came out, uh, you know, as far as I know, nobody was using um, sufficient statistics then. And in fact, um, I have a paper on unemployment insurance with Emmanuel uh, and Camille Landen. Um, the first version of the draft was 2010. And in, in it, you know, we explained that we want to study unemployment insurance optimal unemployment insurance in a macro model using sufficient statistics. And, you know, we talk about that and we explain that we want a sufficient statistic formula. And, you know, I mean, we had a really hard time um, publishing this paper, but the referees were overwhelmingly, which were, you know, mostly drawn from micro and macro labor. Um, they were, all, you know, overwhelmingly negative. Um, they didn't want to hear about sufficient statistics. You know, they wanted to have like simulation and a structural approach. Uh, so, you know, it, it was just like the door was completely shut to that. And, you know, to the point that if you look at the published version of our UI papers in 2018, um, so nine years later in the AJ, we talk in, in them about you won't find the word sufficient statistics because essentially this triggered the referees and 
find it impossible to, pub to publish a paper. So you will see that we talk about estimable statistics, but we don't bring up the term sufficient statistics. So this is to show you a bit the resistance that there was to this approach in macro because uh, macro people were really attached to the structural approach. Um, so this was 2018. Now things you can see that things are changing. There are many, many more papers in macro um, that use uh, that use sufficient statistics, and I think that's uh, that's a great development for the reason that we are going to uh, we are going to discuss in this lecture. Uh, so. So new in macro in 2010, but it's spreading rapidly now. So what are the two things um, that characterize the solution statistic approach and that really um, highlight it's different with the structural approach? So. So in what way uh, is this going to be different from the uh, structural approach? So first, first thing that's key is that you're not going to assume the entire structure of the economy. In the, instead, what you want to do is you want to uh, make a minimal set of assumptions on um, on the welfare um, function and the structure of the economy. Uh, so of course, if you assume nothing about the economy and nothing about welfare, well, you can't say anything about policy. That, that's completely obvious. So you want to make a minimal set of assumptions uh, that allow for uh, policy analysis. So you have a specific, specific policy in mind. And so you'd have to make a specific set of assumption, uh, but really a minimal set of assumption to be able to um, conduct your policy analysis. Um, and of course, so what's nice here is because you don't, uh, so the key thing is that you don't need uh, there's no need to specify the entire model. So what's quite beautiful is that you will realize, in fact, that for many policy questions, you don't need to specify the entire model. Um, you can do a full policy analysis and arrive at policy recommendation just by specifying a subset uh, of your model. So just by specifying a few key structural elements and letting the rest unspecify, um, and you will still be able to get um, good policy um, lessons and policy recommendations. And what's so this is nice for uh, for two reasons. One is that it means that from a theory side, the analysis applies to uh, a range of models. So unlike the structural approach where the analysis is only valid within that structural model, the sufficient stati statistics approach is going to uh, be valid in a range of models. Basically, any model that satisfies this minimal set of assumptions, well, in that model, um, the, you know, the findings are going to be uh, valid. So basically, it works in any model satisfying the minimal assumption. And so, of course, the smaller the set of assumptions, the broader the range of models where, where the uh, analysis was applied. But of course, you know, at some point when you don't have enough, uh, when you don't have, make enough assumptions, the policy finding will be too vague to be useful. So, you know, there'll be a trade-off, and it's, uh, you know, it's part of the, the scientific challenge to be able to just find the right set of assumptions that give you enough insight, but with a broad coverage. Um, so, second thing that's um, useful. So that was so from the theory side, you, the analysis applies to a broad range of models. From a practical side, what's good is that, of course, we don't know how everything in the economy works. We don't know the full structure of the economy. 
And so the the less assumptions, uh, the less assumptions you know you make, the more likely it is that your analysis is actually valid in the real world uh, because you impose less restrictions on you know what you need to as assume for the analysis to be true. And because we don't exactly know what's going on in the real world, the less restrictions you put in your theory, the more likely it is that whatever you assume is going to, to hold in the real world. Uh, you know, if you assume that all oh, prices are competitive, well, then your analysis is true only with competitive prices. If you have any departure of that, the analysis falls down. If you say prices can be anything, then of course, um, your analysis is more likely to be true in the, in the real world. Um, so it's more likely to hold in the real world and be um, useful to practitioners. Um, so that's one thing. Um, second thing that's going to be specific to the uh, solution statistics approach is that we always try to express optimal policies uh, in terms of statistics that can be um, properly estimated. So we know we said that one issue is a structural approach that uh, it's some parameters are very hard to measure, very hard to estimate. And so here in the solution statistic approach, um, we always strive to express all the results in terms of parameters that can be properly um, estimated, you know, using exogenous policy reforms, uh, natural experiments, field experiments, lab experiments, uh, whatever approach that allow you to properly identify these things. Um, so that's the second thing that's, uh, that's very important. So express results and optimal policies. And so here in our lectures, this means that we'll try to estimate our efficient unemployment rate in terms of statistics that can be estimated. In fact, I'll show you how you can estimate them. And I'll show you, in fact, in fact they have been estimated. So I'll show you what the value of the statistics are. Uh, express results on policies in terms of um, statistics. That can be properly uh, estimated. And so here it means that there'll be, you know, you need the need to have some collaboration between theorists who derive these formulas and express them in terms of statistics that can be estimated, and then empiricists will actually go and estimate the statistic. But it also means that when you're a theorist, you've got to look at empirical work to know what people are able or not able to estimate so that then you can use what they're able to do and try to, you know, as a constraint on how you express the results. You know, if you don't look at all what people can estimate, then you'll never be able to express your results in, in terms of statistics that are estimable if you don't know what's doable and what's not doable. Uh, so there is really, there is a strong connection between the between theory and empiric. There's an interplay between these two sides. Uh, so these are the two um, key aspects, uh, minimal set of assumption and expressing every single the result in terms of uh, in terms of statistics that can be properly estimated. So we'll see how to do that in the case of uh, the efficient unemployment rate. Uh, 